Just believe us, we're trying to teach you The rights to read you, know, it's just I procedure, P. baby Trials, instruction, procedure AWS gon' teach ya Trials, instruction, procedure AWS gon' teach ya Here's a tip Welcome, welcome, welcome to Attorneys Another episode of Attorneys with Swag The show you come to watch to learn about the law I'm your host, Eugene Tucson I have two very special guests here today Please introduce yourselves to the audience, guys Hi, so my name is Peter White uh, I'm supervising attorney of the Homeowner Assistance Group at uh, Access Justice Brooklyn Hi everyone, my name is Alex Knippenberg. Uh, I'm a senior staff attorney and litigation specialist at Brooklyn Legal Services Corporation A and I specialize in foreclosure defense and bankruptcy. All right, and, and on this very special episode, what we're gonna be doing is talking about bankruptcy. Uh, things that none of us wanna hear, but what we're gonna to learn today can be a very good, useful tool to getting out of a very tough financial situation. So um, explain, explain to the audience what, what exactly you guys do and how you got into this type of law. So, uh, I well, I got into this type of law like right out of law school. I was looking for a job, and I got a job at a nonprofit where I'm still working now. Initially, I just started as a foreclosure defense, so I was defending homeowners if they were facing foreclosure in court. But our and Peter's organizations are pretty much the only two organizations in New York City, as far as I'm aware, that do complicated bankruptcy cases where we defend. Uh, well, where we represent people who are facing foreclosure in bankruptcy. So because my organization was doing this type of work, basically they taught me how to do bankruptcy and I started doing bankruptcy and then eventually I was doing a lot of bankruptcy on my own. Uh, I've been doing this since 2018. Um, and generally, as I said, most of we file bankruptcy for someone if they're facing foreclosure in court, but we'll make exceptions and, you know, file bankruptcies for someone you know who is just needs to get rid of their debt um generally we file chapter 7 and chapter 13 so only consumer bankruptcy we don't do any business bankruptcies but the general goal is to get people out of foreclosure and settle their loans somehow in bankruptcy court okay and for me uh i started doing bankruptcy work in 2016 so again i was looking for a job and i kind of fell into foreclosure defense work but it was at a private firm so if anyone knows anything about like private foreclosure defense firms, you get cases all over the board. Some people come in with the hair on fire screaming, my house is going to get sold tomorrow. So to stop them from sell or to stop the bank from selling the house, you'll file a bankruptcy, right? Oh, really? Why is so, that? Because basically in bankruptcy and whatever bankruptcy you do, you get what's called an automatic stay. And that's really where a lot of the great value of the bankruptcy arises. That means if they're about to repossess your car, you file a bankruptcy, they can't repossess it. If they're going to auction off your home, you file a bankruptcy, uh, they, they cannot auction off your home. Uh, because basically everything you own or everything you have a right to own, there's basically a freeze on it. Mm. And so basically my old firm, we would just file, like people come in the day before, so we'll file a bankruptcy. Uh, and then we would, you know, try to do the rest of the bankruptcy and essentially help them save their homes. And obviously we'll get into that. Um, but that's how I, that's how I got into it. So general kind of helping homeowners keep their homes. So how does, how does that work? How does filing for bankruptcy when you're, when you're about to get your house taken from you eventually help you keep your house? Like what's the, I, I mean, maybe we might be jumping deep to the deep end, but like, how, like walk me through that. Cause I don't understand, I don't understand how that would work. So I can we'll get, we'll go ahead with that. Uh, but I also want to mention something. So especially like for the lay people, we see a ton of cases where people think, oh, I'm just going to file for bankruptcy. It's going to stop the sale. They're not going to repossess my car. They're not going to do anything like that. They go ahead and they file for bankruptcy and that does happen. But you cannot just file for bankruptcy and not do anything. And a lot of people do that because they, you know, they don't know, other, they don't know how to connect with an attorney. They don't know how to connect with legal services but they're desperate because they're gonna lose their house in a week. So they go ahead and file bankruptcy, we call it pro se filing by themselves, which stops the sale or whatever, but then they don't do anything after and the bankruptcy just gets dismissed and their homes get put back on sale. So it's very important, not just to go and file for bankruptcy, but to follow up with it and do whatever procedure is required to do. So as Peter explained, there's a bankruptcy concept called automatic stay. If you file for bankruptcy, 
it's just the law. They're not allowed to repossess your house now. They're not allowed to repossess your car. They're not allowed to try to collect on your credit cards for a period of time if you do your bankruptcy correctly. So this law, you know, it's a federal law by the government, automatic stay prevents. So if someone does try to repossess your car or home, their penalties of the bankruptcy court can give against us. For example, you know, you filed for bankruptcy a week before the sale. If they still went through with the sale, the court will reverse the sale, but not only that, they can also put some fines or penalties against the uh, whatever entity that went through. So banks, they know that they're not going to sell your house. But after filing, you also have to follow with the court proceedings. So you have to do everything properly. You have to file all your schedules properly. Um, if you're, there's something, so if you owe too much money on a loan, instead of like repaying your arrears in the mortgage, you might want to do something known as loss mitigation and apply for like a loan modification to settle your loan in bankruptcy court. But we see a lot of people, just because they don't know where to go for help, they simply go, they file for bankruptcy, but they don't file anything after and the case just gets dismissed and they don't resolve their issue. And eventually, you know, the lender can foreclose again. Well, on that and I guess like to kind of like piggyback on that, it's like there are keys, there are clear cut key steps to file in a bankruptcy. It's, it's codified. Uh, <clears throat> in the U.S. Code, so it's it's Chapter 11 in the U.S. Code, and basically this is the way it goes, and this is for both Chapter 7s and Chapter 13s. You file, you get an automatic stay, provided you don't file too many times, and we can get into that. Then you have to, it, that's not it at that point, right? So you have to file what's called petition or petition, or you have schedules in that petition. So basically, everything you own or everything you have a right to own, you have to include it. So it's not one of these things where you say, ha ha ha, I've just, you know, I'll just file a bankruptcy and then I'm not going to include this. Uh, there can be penalties against uh, who we call the debtor if, if they don't do that, as in the court will kick your bankruptcy out and say you can't file for two years. So basically, you have to file what's called a petition, include everything. And I, and I even ask my clients, I say, I say, okay, have you told me everything you own, right? Do you have a right to own any property? Do you, like, do you, you know, do you have a, do you have a house in DR that you're not telling us about? And then, you know, people laugh at that, but then they, it gets them thinking and they're like, oh yeah, I do have a right to, you know, uh, you know, uh, I do have a right to like my family's property, you know, somewhere else. And, you know, we both work in Brooklyn. So, you know, there are, there are, there are a lot of people from other places and, you know, they own other property. But all that has to be included and then basically your goal at the end of the day is to get a discharge from bankruptcy as in to get all your debts wide or wiped away uh for what we call in the business a fresh start mm. and Some, that's something you mentioned though about like house and dr and so on uh we have a lot of cases like or oh, do i have to include this do i have to mention this it doesn't work like, you have to include everything there's no like a lot of clients ask for bankruptcy, oh, I don't want to include this in bankruptcy. It doesn't work like that. You have to include all your assets, all your income, everything gets included. You can't hide your house in the DR or your personal injury lawsuit. Everything you owe, own or owe has to be put in a petition. Now, when you say, are we talking about like household items, like, like, like yeah. books and toys or, oh. or like, like, like a television, cameras? Yes. Technically, yes. but so what, like, like if, like, how fine, how fine, a uh, fine tooth comb do I have to go through? We're talking about like individual items or we're we talking about real property like cars and, and homes. So this is the thing. The, the way it works is when you file, you get, ex so you have to include everything, right? But you get exemptions on certain things, right? So let's say you have a car, right? Let's say you have a brand new BMW you just paid off, right? And you're filing a chapter seven bankruptcy. And we'll obviously get into, you know, what that is, but you have to be very careful because like, first of all, the big stuff are the things they're really gonna look at, right? Mm -hmm. Just like, you know, if your wife has, you know, a wedding ring worth $50,000, these are big things, right? But obviously, you know, if you have a Pokemon car collection that's not worth that much, you, you include it in there, right? Like, you know, small stuff, furniture, books, stuff like that. But generally, the trustee, the bankruptcy trustee, isn't going to take a you know look at that. They they want the big stuff. As in, you have that rare Pokemon card that's worth twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, they want to know about that. Okay. And what's the point of of of, of this um, 
of this review? What, 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 what's the end goal? What are they going to do? Are they going to yeah. make you sell all these items? So what is your bankruptcy? Depends on type of bankruptcy. Yeah, it depends what your intention is when you're applying. Like if you're doing Chapter 13 where you're going to pay off all your creditors in full, it doesn't matter if you have a $50,000 ring or something like that. If you're paying everyone back in full, that's fine. But if you're not and you have a bunch of assets, then the trustee can sell those assets to repay people who you owe the money to, basically. Okay, so then before we continue, what is, what is the distinction? So what are the distinction? Is it 7 and 13 or is there more? So th this is, to, to say it on a very basic level, mm -hmm. 7 is liquidation, 13 yeah. is a repayment plan. And basically this is the okay. way it works in a 7, just a very basic level. Let's say you have that, let's say you bought a brand new BMW, it's all paid off, and then you have $50,000 in credit card debt, right? If you are, if, if you file a bankruptcy in that situation, the bankruptcy trustee, the individual that administers the case, which is another attorney, uh, and they're very scrupulous, um, and what they're gonna do, they're gonna take that BMW, sell it to pay off all your creditors, right? Whereas a chapter 13, you'll say, hey, I have all this debt and I want to pay it back. Let me, I have the money, I, I have a decent job. I have a good job. I just fell behind. Let me pay back my arrears or the, you know, the past due balance. Let me pay it back over a course of three to five years. Okay. But it also matters like whether you owe any money on the BMW. If you just bought this BMW and you didn't buy it for cash, but you still owe 50 grand on that BMW, then nothing is not going to, nothing is going to happen to it because you owe 50 grand on it plus your 50k in credit cards, you'll keep it just because you already owe on it. Okay, and when, when you do something like a chapter 13 payment plan, are you getting like a discount on it? Are you getting like a group rate? Like a, like a, like a you know what I mean? Like a consolidation rate? Like how does that work? Um, it's, all right, so basically, the but, way it works for arrears, right? So like the past due amount, you basically take it, you take the arrears, and you slice it up over six, generally 60 months, right? And depending on what type of debt it is, you don't pay interest on it. So let's say if it's a mortgage, you're not gonna pay interest on it, right? But let's say if it's a water bill, because we see some people coming with $50,000 water bills, believe it or not. And, but you, so you have what? to pay. <laughs> Why would yeah. Because people haven't paid their water bill in years, or like their parents own the house, for example, mom and dad died, and yeah. then now they're sitting there in the house like, I never dealt with the finances before, so it accumulates, and then what happens is, you know, they have to pay it back in a plan, because if it gets sold, that's the first thing, you know, it's going to get paid off, but you have to pay interest on that, and I think that's 9% or something. Yeah, but it, or seven, change, yeah. it changes. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, and the credit cards are the same thing, you're just going to pay them back at 0% interest, right? Right yeah. now, you're, maybe you're making minimum payments or whatever, but they're still charging you like... 20 25 percent of the real on the credit card the filing will even if it's a repayment plan it'll stop the collection of interest and you can pay back whatever you owe at that moment but no more interest is going to accumulate but the thing so i've i have a lot of debt and i've 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 done a lot of different things in trying to figure out my debt but and basically long story short i've ruined every relationship with every bank but chase <laughs> <laughs> Which is usually Must, the first like, one you ruin it with, right? Uh, huh? Which is usually the first one you ruin it with. So that's impressive. It's, it's well, impressive. Chase, Chase, they're all pretty bad. When, when, when yeah. things started falling through, Chase was the one that I had my business account was, and I didn't want to like, I, I, did, I wanted to basically keep that one not mess with, let, not let my personal debt mess with where my business account is at. Um, but eventually I had to close those credit cards too, but I was able to, through Chase, get on a zero interest payment plan mm -hmm. to close it out. So without even bankruptcy, you can get, you can just act your, I, if I would have known this, right, when I first got into uh, like a, a amount of debt in which I can't repay it, I would have just closed all my accounts, got them all on zero interest because the payments are relatively small compared to the payments I was making so, with interest. I mean, it's all like individually, like your personal circumstances. For example, if you don't own a lot of property or something like that, the credit card might be willing to do it. A lot of times when we have clients, credit cards might actually even file a lot judgment lawsuit against you yep. and like try to get into your wages if you have wages or if you have a house, maybe even like put some kind of a lien on the house 
and then it's gonna mess up if you're trying to sell the house or if you basically if you have a lot of assets the credit card might try to go after you and put something in so but everyone's like situation is different like if something like that works and we don't we don't tell them oh you should file bankruptcy immediately it's like whatever your personal circumstances are we can advise you and like guide you and you know talk to you about what happens and, and then also just like it's a piggyback on that right it, it's all individual but like a, a lot of times at least in our organizations because we do like basic chapter sevens for people and then i do chapter 13s we look at like their debt level right so if you have five thousand dollars in credit card debt yeah. we say why would you file a bankruptcy because that's another thing a chapter seven you can only file one, uh, once every seven. eight years so it's not a magic bullet every other year um but a, but so essentially like we look at their debt level so if someone has comes in they say hey i have fifty thousand dollars in credit card debt and they have no job or they have very little income then they it's you know it's not like they can go back to the credit card company and say hey i'll pay you this much a month because they just don't have it to pay mm -hmm. right and those are a lot of people we deal with for chapter seven but obviously chapter 13 they're going to repayment plan you have to have money yeah okay. and we have to do all and the good thing about it in a way is it's straightforward in a sense that a lot of times we do the numbers ahead of time and like I'll you know I'll do numbers with people and I'll tell them I'll say hey, you want to do a chapter 13 bankruptcy you don't have enough income you mm -hmm. you need to get some contribution income from people in your home you need to go and you know knock on your tenants door and try to get paid from them you, you, <laughs> need, you need you need more income because at the end of the day uh, the trustee the trustees can sniff this stuff out, especially chapter 13 trustees. They can see which cases are BS and they'll sniff it out and they'll say, look, this person doesn't have enough income. They'll try to get you out of it quick because it just adds more work on their plate. Mm. I think we should explain what a trustee is. Yeah, it's a good point, actually, because yeah. we haven't really touched upon yeah. like what a trustee does. Do you want to start? Yeah. Um, so whenever I'll start and then you can like <laughs> pick it back on me. So whenever you file for bankruptcy, like in general court, as you know, there's a judge, there's one side and then there's another side. In bankruptcy, there's no plaintiff and defendant. You, the person who files for bankruptcy is called the debtor. And then anyone who you owe the money to is called creditor. If it's a credit card, it's an unsecured creditor because it's not secured by anything. There's no collateral, there's no house, there's no car. If you have a car or a house or something like that, it's called a secured creditor. And there's a judge in bankruptcy court, just like in any other court. There's also a trustee, and the role of the trustee is basically to look into your finances and decide what to do. Uh, in the chapter trustee, uh, in the chapter 13, trustee is in charge of all the payments. So you make all your monthly payments to the trustee most of the time, and then trustee will redistribute it over people who you owe the money to your credit card, your arrears in the mortgage, the water bill. So you make this one payment and then the trustee gives it to whoever filed proof of claims and gives them the money. In the chapter seven, the role of the trustee is basically to look into like if you're hiding any assets, you know, if you have any assets, if you don't have any assets, they don't, they don't, they're just gonna, you meet with them one time, they interview you for like 15 minutes, ask you questions to see if you're hiding anything. If you qualify and you're not hiding anything, they're just gonna give you a discharge. Or, but if you are hiding something and they find it, they isolate it up because that's how they get paid. Uh, if you're, you know, hiding they, they a house, what, they what up? What do they do? They'll, their eyes lit up because that's oh, how their eyes light up. Because <laughs> that's how they that's get the paid. Truth. They get a commission on. Oh, we can sell your house and pay your creditors, and that's how they'll get like commission or. Oh wow! Yeah. So they, it's it's to the direct financial benefit to find stuff. Okay, yeah. and what like for example, like say you're married. You want to get bankruptcy, yeah, but your question. wife is like, like financially fine. How do those things get cut up? Like, it, well, they they want to know about that yeah. too in chapter seven because they they want to see they want to make sure. And you know, New Yorkers out there, I mean, you know, we you know we we know how people you know it's like put everything in one spouse's name, yeah. then you have the other spouse doesn't own any you know anything yeah. you know that kind of hide stuff, but trustees like they they want to they want to know about that especially in chapter seven mm -hmm. because again this is how they make their money okay and generally a, a an attorney's job in these situations is to even before you file especially chapter seven a lot of work comes before you file to make sure number one all the assets they have people have are exempt right if possible and then the non-exempt assets let's say you have a boat right you have a ton of debt you know you own a boat 
and you know tell them hey you know this this boat there's there's no exemption for this boat and when i say an exemption basically a federal or, or federal or state rule that says you can have like let's say you have a car that's worth three thousand dollars that you can have a car that's worth three thousand dollars and the trustee will not touch it right mm. so the attorney's job is to essentially dot all the i's and cross all the t's with the exemptions and any unexempt debt that has to be turned over then they you know the, the, the client understands it right because i've had clients before you know they go out they buy an s-class mercedes and before we even file we tell them you need to take the tags off this car you need to put it in your driveway you need to tell them to come pick it up because i can tell you right now that's what you know that's what they that, that that's what's going to happen because this is this is an uh, this is an unexempt debt and you have too much other debt do you want to proceed with a bankruptcy Right, mm. and the trustees going, you know, trustees going to make sure that happens. Whereas in a chapter thirteen, the goal of the trustee, and and and, and also just to kind of like expound on what you said, right? Um, the trustee is going to make sure your plan payments correct because you have to submit a plan to the court. So the trustee is going to make sure all the numbers are correct, that it makes sense, that the tr that that the creditors, as in you know, the mortgage company. Uh, you know, a credit card company, all you know, all these people you own, or institutions you own money to, or owe money to, that they are are given uh, a you know a fair share of what's owed, right? Depending on the plan. But if that's not the case, or if you screw up, the trustee will file what's called a motion to dismiss, basically asking the asking the judge to dismiss the bankruptcy because it's not going to work. But if you do everything right, the trustee is going to recommend confirmation, where it's basically you don't really need to go back to court. You don't need to file any new plans. Just keep paying every month. And then at the end, they'll, and, and basically at the end, the, all the court's going to do is issue an order, uh, discharging the debt, and then that's I, it. I, I, but in a I, chapter 13 circumstance, are you just paying off the debt? What's getting discharged then? Well, but, but you have to, so the thing is chapter 13, right? Um, it's, so basically you have a plan, like you have a debt percentage you pay off, right? So generally, as an attorney, you wanna to shoot to a, uh, for 100% of the debt paid off. You literally have to put the percentage of debt paid off in your plan, right? But sometimes it may be less than that. Sometimes it may be 50%. And if the trustee has a problem with the percentage, the trustee says, well, they should get more money or this should be done differently, then they're not gonna recommend confirmation. But this is what you said, like kind of like what you said before, right? you can actually get a very favorable deal in the end if you let's say if you have to pay 50 or 60 percent of your debt off as opposed to a hundred percent and what so, i'm just gonna add something really yeah. quickly so like let's say you have lots of credit cards and your mortgage takes the entire equity of your house and everything else is exempt so you're not going to be paying the credit cards back at all because they're going to get discharged you're not going to be paying 100 percent if your income is low enough so if you if you don't have too many assets and your mortgage just takes the whole equity of the house, most of the unsecured debt, which is like credit cards and stuff, are gonna get discharged, even in the 13. So that can be beneficial for you. Uh, mm, okay. There's a lot of other, like very small, you can get liens discharged, liens that are on the house. In the 13, sometimes you can also get a second mortgage completely discharged and declare it to be, not discharged, but declare it to be unsecured and you wouldn't have to pay it back. And there's so things then, like I, that. What so I guess this seems like the important part. How how are these choices made? Like what yeah. what's the meat and the tables of that aspect? It's just of, the numbers, like yeah. everything, like your income, your the assets you. Every case is individual. We have to go over your income, your spouse's income, and whoever, and all over your assets. See if you have any, you know, too many assets and stuff like that. And then we combine the numbers together, and we look at the numbers, and we can see if that's doable or not. No, mm. exactly. But it it's it's. Some of this stuff is super important because just like um, what Alex was alluding to, right? So let's say if you have a second mortgage and you don't have any equity left, then that the amount of the mortgage that exceeds whatever equity or uh, exceeds whatever like uh, equity you have left in the home or the value of the home basically becomes like a credit card debt. So let's say if you're only paying 50% of your credit card debt back, that part of the mortgage you would only pay 50% of that back. So you get a, you can get a pretty good deal on that. And then- What does that mean? Like, I, I don't so, so, all right. so, you go ahead, oh, go oh, I'm sorry. No. Um, so let's say, very simple. 
Let's say your home is worth five hundred thousand dollars. Okay. You have a first mortgage for four hundred. You have a second mortgage for two hundred. So you have six hundred thousand dollars in what we call secured debt because it's secured by the house, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say you have a fifty percent plan, right? So that first mortgage is four hundred thousand. So it can all be paid back with the sale of the home, right? So that's secured debt. But that second mortgage, because the home's only worth five hundred. That first hundred is secured, so that has to be paid back fully. But that second hundred, right, that exceeds the value of the home, that that goes into the unsecured pot. So like a credit card. So if you're only paying fifty percent of that cre the credit cards, you only have to pay fifty percent of that hundred thousand dollars. So basically, you could essentially get a fifty thousand dollar discount on it, on the mm. home. Um, there's so many little things that you can do in bankruptcy that people don't really, like. That works for a car too. If you brought, bought a brand new truck for 50 grand and two, year, two years later you barely made a dent and you still owe 45, but the truck is only worth 20,000 now. You file for bankruptcy, you can do a motion to change how much the truck is worth. So from 45, you can get it down to 20 and you'll only owe 20 on it and then you save like what, 35. Again, all of this is like fact specific, depends on your income, depends on everything else. But you can do that with a car as well and bring the value down of whatever you own the car. Mm, okay. And, and adding on to that, just a, a quick thing. Also in Chapter 7s, when you get a discharge in Chapter 7, you're no longer personally liable yeah. for that debt. So let's say that truck goes down to $20,000 in value and you, and, and you still owe forty five or fifty on it. You could say, you know what? I don't want the truck anymore. I'm not paying $45,000 on a $20,000 truck. Mm -hmm. Here, bank take it back right and with a, a, and if you do that in other circumstances they can come after you for that remaining amount because yeah. they can't sell it for 45 anymore they can only sell it for 20. Okay. after you file a bankruptcy and get a discharge you get a personal discharge that's what we call it too they can't come back for you uh come back come back for that debt so basically even like a house right you can get a personal discharge against a house you can literally walk away you can say this house is worth eighty thousand dollars and i owe three hundred thousand dollars on it i don't care about this anymore I'm going to file chapter seven, get a personal discharge, bank, sell it if you can, but you can't come after me for the debt anymore. And then when you, because obviously people say the benefit of bank going, doing a bankruptcy is you, your, your credit score and stuff like that start to yeah. recover. What, how does that factor in? But like the people who come to us, they want to file, their credit score is already in the toilet. Like the credit score, I tell them, yeah, your credit score is already so bad. Like it can't get any worse. So. How is bankruptcy going to impact you? You're already like as low as it can be. And then we talk about like things you can do if you want to improve your credit. Yeah, post bankruptcy, you can always, you need to work on it, you need to work on all your payments. But if your credit score is great, generally you wouldn't come. I mean, there are exceptions, of course, but generally yeah. you wouldn't come to file for bankruptcy. Okay. All right. And so, all right. So, and, and these are the two big ones, 7 and 13? Is this well, something else? They're the consumer ones, right? So 7 and 13 are generally consumer bankruptcies. And then there's some other bankruptcies that are generally for business. Although, funnily, there could be a circumstance where a person does not qualify for either 7 or 13, and they have to file for 11, which is generally only for businesses. It's very rare, but it does happen because of basically qualifications for both 7 and 13. Have you ever had an 11 before? Or? I haven't had 11, but basically the biggest situation we have yeah. is the, the debt limit situation. There's a limit on how much debt you can have. So unsecured debt, cre like credit cards, stuff like that, it's, uh, it's now $465,000. So if you owe over $465,000 in credit cards or personal loans, those are generally the big ones, you can't file a seven, you have to file 13. And for, a cha I mean, 11. And for a chapter, thir uh, I'm, I'm sorry, if it's a cured debt, the limit is one point, uh, sorry, $1,395,000. So that means if, you know, you buy a Maybach somehow and you can't afford it and now you owe half a million dollars, you can't just file a chapter 13. You go right into the chapter 11 pool. I keep seeing one Maybach in my neighborhood and I'm trying to figure out who it belongs to. So, okay, and what, and I guess what, what is the distinction between 11 and 7 and 13? So, again, generally 11 is just for businesses, like, you know, whatever business wants to file and, like, re, re, like, refinance all their debt, restructure all their debt and stuff like that. 
generally a person would not file, but it's just like sometimes they don't feel any either 7 or 13 and they could file for 11. 11 is going to be like very similar to 13, but because they don't qualify for the 13 based on the law, they'll have to file 11. And 11 is just them like I usually say like one bankruptcy case because we do a lot of state court cases and one bankruptcy case the amount of work is like four or five state court cases it's like way more work 11 and no like state court compared to a bankruptcy case so oh, state right. court we do a lot I would say four state court cases equals one bankruptcy case oh. but then one chapter 13 like five chapter 13 case will probably be like the amount of work like one chapter 11 the amount of yeah. work in chapter 11 is just inconceivable like some attorneys will do two cases a year they'll have a retainer of like 70 grand they're just super complicated and hard so we okay don't that's well, why what, the, ma oh, well, what makes them harder like just a step shift amount of work them? yeah like you have to file different stuff with court like every single day all business reports everything like that like you know like whenever you see like those big law so not big law firm big companies filing for bankruptcy and how much they pay to the bankruptcy council it's like millions of dollars like red lobster was doing that whoever all those big companies who do restructuring that's like the biggest like retainers that they pay the lawyers it's the bankruptcy lawyers yep i mean and and then also especially with these big companies they may hire like a, I forget who it was or what entity they hire like 19 different firms yeah. because the thing is remember at the end of the day whether you're an individual or a corporation every oh, one one business going bankrupt hired 19 yeah. different. billion dollars because everything has to be that accounted so for and then also in a chapter 11 crazy things happen like I was uh, reading um, that Michael Lewis book about uh, FTX and Sam Bankman Freed <laughs> and basically the, uh, the the bankruptcy with that. And pretty much the minute they filed bankruptcy, they hired an attorney, the firm that did, they hired an attorney to come in and act as CEO mm -hmm. and he started filing pe uh, firing people and then they had to get other firms involved to basically do an accounting of everything to bas you know, basically get everything sold off. But uh, the chapter 11 is very complex. But they're also, and just as a side note, there are also a few other types of bankruptcy. Yeah. Chapter 12, which is for factory farms and fisheries, I mean, family farms and fisheries, not factory farms and fisheries. You have chapter nine, which is municipalities, uh, i.e. Detroit. And then you have the newest one, <laughs> chapter 15, which is, inter so corporations uh, or foreign corporations that have substantial interest in the United States. So now they can actually file bankruptcy in the United States. Have you ever had a farmer or a fisherman? Unfortunately, no. I'm I sure we got one one day. Well, I've never had one either for Chapter Twelve. Okay. So, all right. I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm seeing the big picture a little bit better. So, go, let's go through more of the steps. Someone someone comes into your office mm -hmm. before you file for bankruptcy. You have to assess their assets, try to see a pathway. Um, seven or thirteen. Let's just assume seven or thirteen once they get started what are like what what, what happens next how, how do these the rest of the stuff play out um i mean for us most of the time it's going to be a 13 just because mostly we work with homeowners seven is generally you know you want to discharge all your debt you don't really have any income you don't really have much assets we'll take those sometimes but generally we have to work with homeowners uh you know depending on i'll start requesting all the financial documents from you um, I'll do like a brief conversation with you first, see what you want to do. Most of the time you're behind on your mortgage. Um, I'll try to find out how long you're behind. If you're not that long behind, I'll do what we call a traditional chapter 13. Traditional means you're just going to pay back the arrears on the mortgage and other stuff. And you know, depending on how much, you oh, mostly it's going to be hundred percent plan, but sometimes it's not. But then we, you know, what me and Peter actually mostly, not mostly, but what we often get is someone calling us and telling, I have a sale date in two days, I don't know what to do. Or we get referrals from housing counselors who are like other entities that work with homeowners who set them up with us. And it's like, uh, usually if you have a sale in two days, I can't do anything for you unless, but I can tell you, you can go file for bankruptcy by yourself to, if you call me two days before. If I collect all your financials and if everything looks right to me, I'll represent you. In terms of financials, you know, we just collect whatever bank statements, tax returns. 
you have to file tax returns. A lot of our clients don't file tax returns, and then it's one of the requirements that if you're going to be filing for bankruptcy, unless you're exempt, but if you you have to be making way too low, and if you are, you're probably not going to qualify for Chapter 13. Um, we collect all the documents, and then we'll do like a more intense intake with you where we'll try to ask you every question, like do you have a house in Puerto Rico? So many times, right, right before we file, we get people, oh yeah, but I forgot to tell you, I have this personal injury lawsuit. I expect to inherit like 100,000 from it. I said, okay, uh, to start all over again now. <laughs> so like, but what we do is we fill out the petition and you know, parts of the petition are called schedules. Schedule A and B are like your, you know, your assets. Schedule I and J is like your income and expenses. Basically, we fill out all your income and expenses to a T. And then in the if you're filing Chapter 13, we also fill out a plan, like who's going to get paid what in that Chapter 13 plan. And if everything is good, we file your petition for you. And then depending, you know, you're going to have a, something that's called a 341 meeting. The 341 meeting is that meeting with a trustee, what we talked about earlier. Trustee is there to examine, to make sure you didn't lie on anything, to make sure everything looks in place, everything looks correct depending everything depends on like what your petition the question the trustee is going to ask your client depends on like what you put on the petition and things like that and then the other i said traditional chapter 13 is like where are you going to pay arrears people who call us right before the house is going to be sold generally they've been in foreclosure for like six or seven years so most of the time they don't have the income to pay back the arrears but bankruptcy court in new york so it's not every bankruptcy court in every single state I think only a couple states participate in law submit. And know? it depends and depends yeah. also on, oh, yeah. the, on the on the on the individual court. So like you can't do on Long Island. So yeah. just <laughs> just, just clarification yeah. about uh, bankruptcy. So bankruptcy court is federal, right? So the great thing about it is on a very on a basic level, it's the same rules in fifty states plus Puerto Rico because Puerto Rico has its own. Uh, it has its own bankruptcy court uh, yeah. that follows the federal law. But the thing is, then you have uh, district courts, so individual districts. So let's say you're in Brooklyn, Queens, and Long Island, Eastern District, and then if it's Manhattan, uh, Manhattan, the Bronx, and like parts of West or Westchester is Southern District, right? But you have different courts in those districts. So the Eastern District has two courts. You have the one in Brooklyn and Queens. All the judges do loss mitigation. But then you have the one in Long Island in which only some of the judges did them. And then now I haven't practiced out there in a while, but here none of the judges do it now. So loss mitigation is something like if you're way too behind on your mortgage, you can't pay the arrears back. But you can apply for something known as loan modification. So it's basically you submit your financial package to the bank. The bank is going to review it and they can see if they're going to modify your loan. This is mostly what we do in state court, but you're allowed to do it in bankruptcy court too. But only few bankruptcy court partic courts participate in the process. And this process was started by Judge Morris in the Southern District of New York in Manhattan as a response to the 2008 financial foreclosure crisis. Mm -hmm. Because there were so many people behind mortgages, so many people in foreclosure. So she instituted, I guess, I don't know if it's a rule or this program, I would say. This, she instituted this program called Loss Mitigation Program where you know you have another option when you if you're filing for bankruptcy where you can engage in loss mitigation with the lender and try to s resolve and get a loan modification and basically get a new loan with the same lender if you qualify if you had a temporary financial hardship you know you were out of a job but you now you have a job you can apply for loan modification as Peter said, right now, though, all the judges in Brooklyn do it, but none of the judges in Long Island do it. And it's individual judges' preference, I guess. And two judges on Long Island used to do it, but they stopped. And like, what, what goes into, like, the judge? Like, if I go into that court, I, I can't, and I request it, mm -hmm. and there's a judge just in, in another county... Like I can't. What what, what is going to be the justification for that judge saying no? No, thank no, you. I don't participate in it. Yeah. Like they just they, decide not to. They don't because they don't want to do it. Oh wow! And there's nothing in the bankruptcy court that actually authorizes that program. It's just judges who decided they want to do it, and then yeah. to help homeowners who are behind on like mortgages and things like that. Wow. Yeah. It's damn. 
But there are other things you can also do in bankruptcy besides like lo uh, loss mitigation. Um, like you do like an adversary proceeding and then also you can object to claims. And this is actually a really cool thing. So um, let's say someone, so let's say, because what happens is when you go into bankruptcy court, it's not like you file and then, you know, the credit card company or the, 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 uh, the bank says, okay, you know, this is, you, you know, you basically just have to state everything that's like owed on the mortgage, right? And the court says, okay, we'll take your word for it. No, what happens is they have to come in and file a proof of claim, right? So you have to, and the proof of claim is basically, let's say a credit card company says, well, you owe me $30,000. They have to come in, they have to provide supporting paperwork, like a payment history, uh, supporting that $30,000. And if they don't do it in a certain amount of time, then that claim is barred. They can't come in or they have to file a motion to extend the time so they can bring in the claim for whatever reason. Um, so, but you can actually object to that. I actually had to do that recently uh, with a mortgage. I had to object to the amount. And then basically you file it as a motion and the judge hears it and the judge can say, eh, you're right. You say they owe you $50,000 and they can only pro prove they owe you 20. Yeah, I get it. Okay, I'm going to issue an order. They owe you 20 now. And see, I can be quicker than state court. And then you can also do what's called an adversary proceeding, which is, this is actually a really cool thing about bankruptcy yeah. because you can file the bankruptcy of 30 days, you'll file the adversary proceeding. So let's say you say, okay, well, this bank is going to file a proof of claim saying, I owe this amount, but no, this is fraud. This is straight up fraud. I'm going to file another lawsuit in bankruptcy court, and we're going to have a trial over it in bankruptcy court uh, to basically get that amount discharged because we say it's fraud. And then you can do like discovery as in you can exchange, you know, the size will exchange documents, but it happens a lot quicker than it would in state court. So instead of dealing with it case by case in state court, you can basically bundle everything, throw it in bankruptcy court and get your entire situation. Uh, you can get your entire situation handled. And that's why you see chapter 11s. They require so, so, so much work in chapter 13s as well, yeah. because it's not just dealing with like, let's say if you have five creditors and five cases in state court, you're dealing with all those at one time in bankruptcy court. Now, when you say state court, you mean like civil court? In yes, state, state, yeah, state civil court, state yes. Court. Oh, okay, like more claims court. Or like King, well, depending on it, but oh, generally so, mm. like Supreme Court, yeah. Supreme, Supreme civil, civil Court. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. So that, and that, all right. And then what happens, and this is gonna go to our, uh, our segment, Let's just cut to the segment. So on this segment of Adventures of Eugene and Ev, we're going to discuss my time at Claro. Uh, I know you said that your company runs Claro, right? Can yep. you break down Claro to the... Um, I feel like I'm going to butcher it. Okay, so basically Claro, it stands for... Um, uh, Civil it, it, Legal it, Advice uh, Resources Office. Yes, so basically... Uh, the idea is Claro, it's a, it's, a, it's a civil legal resources clinic that helps people with their consumer debts because the premise is that uh, out of all the consumers in New York State that have, uh, or all the consumers in New York State that have cases in civil court, right? Mm -hmm. So we're thinking generally credit card debts, um, only 1% were represented. One sec. Yeah, go ahead. Only 1%? Only 1% were represented by attorneys. So there's a clinic set up to basically provide information to those people. Um, and then also you know, help people with motions they may have. And then we have another uh, program called Volunteer Lawyer for the Day, where attorneys in my organization and volunteer attorneys will actually go in and litigate uh, these cases for these people as in they will have you know trials for these people or, you, or, or attempt to settle their cases so they can get the best uh, you know offer possible. Yeah, and really I holding yeah, bank seat to the fire. And I part I participated in both of those programs. And the, I, I would say the biggest thing that was a shocker to learn in being in those programs as an attorney, or I was in law school at the time, um, was that a lot of times uh, credit card companies will sell your debt, yeah. right? And once they sell your debt, um, I think this goes back to what you were saying before. These these companies that buy the debt, they own the debt, but they can't prove uh, they can't prove how what like they don't get. Uh, from my understanding, because I haven't done it in a while, they don't get the proof of how much the debt is really owed or, or, or any of the papers that would really prove that you actually own the, the amount of debt they say they own. Is that, that, is that actually a fair description? Yes. So how does that play a role in bankruptcy? It's not always the case though. Sometimes they can, if they can't prove them, 
they can't prove but sometimes they can prove it depends like what kind of documents they got from the original lender once they pass yeah. it down to you yes i, I so feel like the same thing, thing as foreclosure case. too basically but yeah in bankruptcy it's kind of like the same thing as peer uh you can i started recently doing this because i filed a case recently and i got a bunch of like credit cards from 2000 2004 i'm like what is this and then they have to attach a proof of claim and they have to attach a bunch of documents to substantiate that they own the debt and that my client owes it to them and they don't attach anything if they don't have enough proof like that they acquired it uh, their yeah. like original like whatever and uh, any like transactional history most likely they can't get the claim in and you can object to the claim and if the judge sides with you you don't have to pay it back yeah because i guess my understanding was that what happens is they will buy the debt but legally speaking let's say they're bank, buying it from citibank mm -hmm. citibank can only provide them with a certain amount of documentation legally i guess some of some of the documentation they can't give it to them at least that's what the attorneys were, were telling me which is why if you if you find out it's like, hey, this is this debt collector that brought the debt from Citibank or for whatever bank, and you ask them, all right, well, show me what proof that you have that you actually own the debt, they, a lot of times they won't be able to provide the proof because they don't get it from the banks. That well, because, yeah, they, so, I mean, obviously the first thing, you know, like debt 101 is you need the promissory note, right? Exactly. Um, and if they don't have the promissory note, because that, they have to provide the promissory note. Uh, if they don't have the promissory note, then they can't, they can't prove that they're, prove they're standing. And that's, the, that's like foreclosure work. That's, that's foreclosure work 101. Do they own the note? Or, uh, because they generally provide copies with like when they file a case with the summons and complaint. Mm -hmm. But can they, can, they, can they provide enough evidence uh, that they own the note and can they provide proof of default? So basically the agreement you made and proof that you stopped paying, right? So even, you know, a lot of times they'll, you know, they'll have the note because they'll sell the note off. They'll, you know, just sell the note off but where where's all the other documentation showing that this individual hasn't paid do you have a concise payment history uh you know for that individual um do you have letters do you have uh other documentation and you know i don't want to really get into the legalese of it but but basically can you prove that that person stopped paying yeah okay and that that's what it is and and the, and, and the amount that they owe okay all right all right that makes sense so going back to bankruptcy court, um, so you, you meet with the trustee, what, what happens, like how, how do, do, does a trustee go about discovering if you did an accurate accounting of your assets? Like what exactly are their resources? How are they, how are they figuring out? Is it all like online? Like are they using certain databases? Like mm -hmm. what is their, like how, do, how are these, these assets found, if that makes sense? I mean, all it depends on like what you provide. That's mm -hmm. why you have to file tax returns. If mm -hmm. your income that you report doesn't match the income of the tax returns, she's gonna start asking you questions. They also have their own like sources and like investigators to like check out. Like, if you put the value of the house is only six hundred thousand, they're not gonna just take your word for it. They're gonna go and check it for themselves. And if they discover that oh, you put a six hundred thousand, but we actually think it's worth a million. Um, you know, you can't really hide something like this. Um, you know, with regards to like assets in other countries, it's a little bit harder, but they do have their own uh, ways, you know, of trying to figure it out. I mean, they don't get everything. Sometimes they miss stuff. But generally, whatever you put in the petition, they'll compare it to all the documents because you have to submit all of your financial documents to the trustee as well to, you know, verify that what you're putting in the petition. So for example, if you're doing loss mitigation and you're trying to apply for loan modification, on the loan modification, you're actually trying to show that you have as much income as possible because you want the bank to give you the loan modification. You want the bank to think that you qualify, that your income is high, but then you can't go and, because trustee is gonna want a copy of that application and you go and submit to the bank. And not with our cases, but I often see like, because we're when you appear in bankruptcy court, it's kind of like, Free for all, uh, everyone appears at the same time, and you'll often hear the trustee like, "Well, on the petition you said one thing, but I reviewed your loan modification. You have completely different income there. What's up with that?" And then you know you'll have to correct. Generally, you're given a lot of leeway to amend the petition to correct it. She's not gonna like go after you if you have like some small mistake, even like something bigger mistake. All you have to do is just amend the petition and file, you know, your income change or your asset was actually something different. 
you can amend and file freely, kind of. And then also, um, I mean, so when you go to the 341 meeting, meeting with the mm -hmm. trustees, the trustee literally asks you, it's like, mm -hmm. do you have any pending suits? Do you have any property you haven't listed here? Do you have, uh, you know, have you listed all your income accurately? Have you listed all your debts accurately? Are you, are you set to receive an inheritance? Are you set to receive any other property? Uh, like, I remember this one meeting I had, uh, 341 meeting. I just happened to be in the room, you know, fly on the wall. And the trustee asked uh, this individual, the trustee said, okay, do you have any assets you haven't listed on your petition? <laughs> he said, oh, I have one, I believe he said, I have one lock, right? So the trustee- so One what? Lock, right? What's a lock? So I, I'm, I'm getting there. Um, and this individual happened to be from South Asia. And so the trustee said, you know, and he did it through an interpreter. And then trustee said, he said, what's a lock? What's a lock? The trustee's going crazy. He wants to know what a lock is. And the interpreter says 300,000 rupees, right? So the trustee's really mad now because the trustee doesn't know what 300,000 rupees is. It could be, you know, $5 for all the trustee knows. The trustee's like, what's that? What's that? What's that? And then the interpreter says, oh, it's $100,000. And the trustee's eyes just perk up and mm -hmm. he smiles because he knows uh, uh, you know again it's like get a can, yeah and he, he gets a he gets a commission why does he get a commission and, and like would he have gotten that commission if, if the if the the debtor put that on his petition so so basically mm -hmm. it de depends what bankruptcy or what, what what chapter you file so it's a chapter seven trust uh i'm sorry it's a chapter seven uh bankruptcy there is not a hundred thousand dollar exemption, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So I mean, but again, it's like if you have a hundred thousand dollars in certain situations, why are you filing Chapter yeah. Seven we, bankruptcy? To all our client, you don't file. You have so many assets. Yeah. You shouldn't. Like our advice in the case would not even be filing at all. It comes up when they're trying to hide something from us, and then we don't discover that they have assets, and then all of a sudden they get scared when they're because they're also asked it's under oath like you have to say this work tell the truth or blah, blah, blah. so whenever you answer the trustee you're doing it under oath so you also don't want to like perjure yourself but our advice would be no don't file because you have so much mm. stuff but what peter was all you only get commission in well not only but generally just in chapter seven the way chapter 13 gets paid is that he takes 10 percent of whatever your payments are so yep. if you're repaying back hundred hundred thousand back in the arrears the uh, your plan is actually going to be 110000 because you have to pay the trustee 10% of whatever you're paying back. And, and that's also why we tell clients, whatever you do, make sure to make your payments every month, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're you, like, it could be a hundred things going on in your bankruptcy case. It can be convoluted. Uh, it could be a very tough situation in, that needs time for you to disentangle with the creditor. But if the trustee isn't getting paid every month, or isn't getting paid on the time, the trustee is very angry because the trustee isn't getting their money. But if the trustee gets their money on time, the trustee will generally work with you. Yeah. Mm. And how many how many cases a year does a trustee do? It sounds like being a trustee is like is a good job. <laughs> ah, Hundreds, a of thousand. Lot. But they probably most bankruptcy cases get dismissed and not confirmed, I would say. Yeah. And, and Especially but they still get well, there is a circuit right. split actually. In New yeah. York, if your case is dismissed, trustee keeps the money regardless not yeah. all the money just his 10 percent okay so like you paid for two years but you couldn't pay anymore your case gets dismissed you get your money back like if you didn't confirm it so let's say you're applying for loan modification while you're applying for loan modification you have to make monthly payments to the trustee every single month let's say it went over for two years case never get, got confirmed but the trustee is holding a hundred thousand dollars trustee has to return the money back to you minus 10 percent but in other circuits, they have to return everything to you, like even without the 10%. So I think whatever circuit Colorado is in, they have to return everything to you. Yeah. So someone might eventually file a lawsuit to try to, because there's a circuit split in those whatever circuits are. So yeah, and I, I would imagine trustees well, just, yeah, are more inclined to dismiss here then since they're going to get their 10% anyway. Um, the, it depends on the district. So, kinda, yeah, so the last thing I heard, so before the pandemic, the Eastern district had one of the lowest confirmation rates mm -hmm. in the country, but the Southern district have one of the highest. 
because well they had Judge Morris who was just amazing and then yeah. like she really worked hard with you to confirm and then actually the southern district trustee is actually is one of the trustees in the dist eastern district now yeah okay and yeah she's good yeah she, she is really good. how many how many trustees are there right now there are two in the eastern district and so there are one in the southern three, oh okay wow three judges in Brooklyn and three judges in the central Islip one trustee does two judges in Brooklyn, one in Central Islip, and the other the one the other way around, one in Brooklyn, two in Central Islip. And how many? How many? That doesn't seem like a lot of judges. How many? How many bankruptcies are usually filed every year? I would I would think it's a lot. Yeah, but a lot of them will just be like if you're filing a seven with no assets, you'll never see the judge. You'll just see the trustee, and then if the trustee says you're good and give you a discharge, you'll never see the judge. Forty-five days later, you're done, and actually, that's yeah. what you want, and that's honestly the mark of a. Like a, a good a good right. competent attorney in a chapter 7 case if you if there's no big issue and you don't really need to see the judge you don't want to see the judge you want to make sure everything is done well on your petitions all the documents are provided so you can get in and you can get out as quickly as possible and okay so then what what makes a, a uh, what makes a petition good enough <laughs> to not have to see the judge so sure. basically all right so number one your income is accounted for, your expenses are properly accounted for, all your assets are properly accounted for with exemptions, right? And then you don't have any, you don't have any troublesome issues. Like let's say if you have a pending personal injury suit yeah. and you file a chapter seven, they're not gonna give you a discharge because they may give you a discharge today and then five years later, you may, win, you know, you may get a million dollar settlement and your creditors don't get paid. So you're just gonna you you're just gonna hold it in bankruptcy during that period. So as an attorney, you want to make sure that issues like that don't exist. Or you know, if they're set to inherit a million dollars next month, that you don't file a bankruptcy and then and then you know the trustee has to go and you know and claw that money back, right? And like sometimes it's not even your fault. Like sometimes you'll file bankruptcy for someone, and a month later their parents will die and they'll inherit the ton of stuff and all of a sudden your case is all messed up yep. and there's like a lot of things you have to do now work with a trustee and things like that okay um all right so uh, so these exemptions because you, you've brought them up uh, uh several times already like yeah. what what are like the top exemptions what makes an exemption qualifies an exemption like, the first thing I think I'll let you go. Oh, yeah. You gotta put whether it's gonna be state or federal exemption yeah. first of all, because in New York you get both state and federal, and it depends like what the goal is of the proceeding. Mostly, if it's a foreclosure related, I use state exemptions, and if it's a non foreclosure, I'll use depending again. For example, federal has a larger, I think, personal injury lawsuit, right? Yeah, in the law yeah. part, yeah. So federal might have bigger exemptions for some things, but state has a way bigger exemption for the house, for example. So that's why when I generally do foreclosure, I'll generally use state exemptions because it's way bigger for the house. Right now it's like 175,000, I think, but it keeps going up every year. I think in California it's like 300,000 or something because of the value of the houses. But basically the exemption is like stuff you owe the trustee cannot go after. Um, you know, you obviously, you don't want them to take, sell you like TV, clothes or whatever. And generally that's easy to exempt. Like you'll have enough in a statute to exempt all those little things. Um, basically the exemption is used for the assets that um, you put the exemption, the trustee cannot go after it. And then it's never going to be sold and never going to be like, the trustee is not going to be able to get rid of it and you'll keep it regardless. So what, like what? What a like a car I drive to work is that going to qualify? So, so this is this is how exemptions work, all right? And to break it down, let's say your home is worth six hundred thousand dollars and you owe five hundred thousand dollars on the home, right? So you're probably going to use the state exemptions because you get like uh, like Alex said, like you get one seventy five. What's called a homestead exemption. So that means that hundred thousand dollars in equity, trustee can cannot touch it, right? So we use that a lot in chapter, especially in chapter 13. But like, let's say I have a basic chapter seven, right? Person comes to me and they say, hey, look, you know, I have all this debt, but I do have a, you know, I do have a car, right? And, you know, let's say you, you know, you owe money on the car. I don't know. The car is worth, 
I don't know, 20,000 and you owe 15,000 on it, right? So I may use a uh, federal, what's called the wild card exemption because I get, think it gives you up to like $11,000, just general exemptions. Mm -hmm. So I'll say, okay, I'm gonna exempt that other $5,000 so the trustee can't sell my car and then pay the debts off. And you basically use it on other, you use it on other things as well. That's, mm -hmm. that's how it works. So let's say you have, a, you know, a very nice MacBook, top of the line, you just bought it, it's $3,000 then you can use that exemption on that MacBook so the trustee doesn't go and sell it. Or just like, you know, you you know, you have a very nice gold chain that's worth a few thousand dollars. You can you you, you can use it on things like that up to a certain point. So what are what other exemptions are there? Like like what are like I guess what are the most common exemptions besides the ones you've <laughs> named before? Well, Peter talked about the home sales because we do a lot of foreclosure cases again. The home sales for the home. But one exemption that Peter brought up is the wild card exemption. Mm -hmm. Basically, you can use it for anything. You know, there's special exemptions like for like everything, there's for electronics, for this, for car, for that. Wild card is whatever is remaining, you can use for anything. Whatever else you need to exempt that you don't want the trustee to go after. And let's just say, I've never seen trustee go after like TV or anything like that. We, you know, your petition has to be like proper, everything has to be proper, but I've never seen trustee go after like something small like that because it's also not worth it to them sometimes. Like, even if you didn't exempt something, but the equity in it is like a thousand dollars, they'll spend more money retaining an attorney. So, even like if the exemption doesn't cover something fully, most likely they're not going to go after it because they like like when there's a lot, a lot of assets, a lot of like stuff. They'll go after it for sure. If it's little and they know like you're from legal services, they're not going to bother. All right. So now like, let's say chapter 13, you want to repay off your debt. You use a homestead exemption. How does that factor it? Does that mean it's almost like that portion of the debt you don't have to pay back? No. So how, how does that, how does exemption work in that situation? It works in, in that situation because what happens is, so homestead exemption only applies to a home in which you live, uh -huh. right? So some people try to file like a chapter seven and they have like a second home, which there, there are things you can do with that. But, um, but basically it only applies to the home in which you live. But let's say you have too much equity. Let's say you have equity in a home, right? Uh -huh. It stops the trustee from saying, wait, you have equity in the home and you know, you're not paying, you know, you're not paying these debts back. Then you, basically the trustee would sell off the home. And well, that's mostly in a chapter seven context, oh, okay. but, uh, in a chapter 13 context, I mean, it could be the same thing depending on like your debt, like your debt level, okay. uh, and then also you, what what you're doing in your plan. But well, we generally don't see that happen. Though. Like in a thirteen, you can choose to sell your house, so yeah. that might be useful for you to have the exemption, so you can pocket the money for yourself yeah, instead of paying the creditors. So if you choose to sell your house in the chapter thirteen. That exemption is that extra money that you're going to take for yourself instead of paying everyone else who you owe the money to. Oh, okay. Does it make sense, kind of? Yeah, I guess so. But like, generally, it's more useful in the seven, just so the okay. trustee wouldn't sell the house. In the thirteen, let's say your plan is a hundred percent plan, you're paying everyone back. It doesn't really matter that much because okay. you're paying everyone back. The trustee's not gonna go after any assets because that's why the three forty one matters. Like if you put your chapter thirteen plan as hundred percent plan, she's just gonna ask you a couple of questions. But because you're paying everyone back, he's not gonna like get too deep. But now if you're only paying like fifty percent back, he's gonna demand like every single receipt for every single thing that you're allege alleging in the petition and uh, things like that. So okay. a lot depends on like what you're doing in bankruptcy as well. Okay, so then I, I feel like we went over this, but I feel like this probably mm -hmm. needs some clarification. How does this choices in the plan, how are they made? What's gonna make you decide where we're, we're gonna go for 50% and mm -hmm. hopefully they approve it or we're gonna go for 100%. Like, how are you making those distinctions? Your, your, your income in a lot of situations. Mm -hmm. Because see, what this is this is a calculation that's done. They take your income minus your expenses, right? And whatever is left over, the excess as we call it. So let's say your excess is $500. Then every month you basically have to, if you have to take that $500 and pay that into the plan. Right, mm -hmm. and so what's cal so basically all your debts are taken together. So your unsecured debts are calculated together, right? And then they'll say, and then they'll be chopped up into sixty pieces, and they'll say, okay, 
This 60? is 60. 60 so, months. 60, so 60 five months. Years. Yes, five years. Oh, it could okay. be three also though. Yeah, but it could be three also. So 36, but that's, that's a different issue. So basically then let's say they do that and they say, okay, what well, comes out to, you have to pay $700 per month. So you have $42,000 uh, $42, in debt. So you have to pay $700 a month, right? But you only have $500 when you take your ex when you subtract your expenses from your income, right? You only have five hundred dollars, so basically you can only pay. So that's thirty out. So that's what thirty out of that's thirty out of forty two. That's about a what twenty four. Seventy five percent. Well, yeah, it's basically like yeah, like a like sixty or something, like it's like sixty percent or something. So basically, that's the that's what you would pay over the life of the the plan. Okay, and so and what and you come to that agreement, what if like what if is that gonna be the agreement that you you live through the life of the plan or, or does it change throughout well, time? Say for example you get a promotion or you change jobs. How how does that affect it? It could. It could, yeah. Yeah. It could? Yeah. So let's say I mean today you're making a hundred thousand then your income goes up to five hundred thousand uh dollars. -huh. Then that, that could have an effect later, especially if you're not paying yeah. hundred uh, percent. If the plan is not hundred percent, every single year you have to provide tax returns to the trustee, yes. uh, and the trustee is going to look and see, you know, and they'll oh, shift it. Well, they'll see if like if you're making way way more money now, then he's not going to be. Well, like, then you can pay hundred percent. Yeah, of the he's going to be like, oh, well, you no longer need to pay seventy five. But I would say. I do way more math in bankruptcy than I ever expected in yeah. law school. <laughs> yeah, but I, so I guess like, let's say for example, you're, you're in the fourth year of a five year plan, six months into the fourth, fourth if six months into the fifth year, right? So you only have six months to go. Mm -hmm. uh, you've agreed to pay 70% and you get a ridiculous like price, like, like a promotion, right? Let's say you go up $50,000. How is, is that? Are, you can't make the difference up that 30% in one year. So like, what, they'll just bring it up a little bit or like, how, how would that work? I mean, probably nothing is gonna happen. Nothing, especially that last yeah, yeah. year, because the thing is by the time you get the income on your tax returns, yeah. and, but, but this is also, you, you do mention, where you kind of allude to a different point. Let's say you're making 100 and you go up to $500,000. Because see, you can calculate how much you will pay into the plan in total, right? Mm -hmm. Especially if it's a 100% plan, you can just go play that, pay that plan off. Mm. Right, so you're like, oh, I, well, I made all this money this year. I'm just going to pay the plan off, get the discharge. Okay, and then what, when the the dis, discharge, so I guess the, what what's confusing me is that on a hundred percent plan, then you just pay off your debt. Why do you need a discharge at that point? What does it matter? Oh, so but it, that's like a technical term for like at the end. But basically, yeah, you you pay it off, and then the court just basically allows you to go. And okay, so if you pay up less than a hundred percent. You'll need approval. You need a yes. uh, like you'll need a discharge that needs to be approved. Yes. But if it's a hundred percent in theory, you will get the discharge because you paid off hundred percent. But I also want to bring something up, like you're talking about discharge. For a lot of my our clients, or at least my clients, discharge doesn't matter. Like if we're defending somebody in foreclosure and we'll file bankruptcy for them, a lot of the times we'll get loan modifications on their foreclosure loan. Uh, we'll get it approved by the court. They're good now. They're no longer in foreclosure. They're making their mortgage payments. They just don't want to continue with their bankruptcy and like, get the bankruptcy dismissed. But they accomplished what they needed to accomplish in bankruptcy. You don't always need to get a discharge because there's so many things that you can accomplish without even getting. And probably more than half my cases get dismissed after I get a loan modification for them because clients no longer want to continue with the process, but they got what they wanted to out of it. And you know the result is good regardless. So, so, so for homeowners specifically, yeah. is that is is that the goal in bankruptcy to, to get a loan modification, or are there other factors? Depends because you also have to realize. So obviously, yeah. mortgage rates are up, right? Yeah. So if you're at a three percent rate and you have arrears, it's better to essentially pay those arrears back at zero percent. Continue paying at three percent because at the, for the life of your loan, if you do the math, you're going to pay much less. But if you get a modification, it gets modified mm -hmm. at six or seven or seven and a half percent, then you're going to pay much more over the life mm -hmm. of your loan and your monthly payment is probably going to go up. So we're seeing, and we, we've spoken about this uh, on a number of occasions, we're seeing more situations than we say, where we say, okay, this client needs to go into a traditional chapter 13 bankruptcy and they need to pay it 
uh, you know, they need to pay their arrears over the course of, or over the course of five years. So, mm. basically, you have to keep track of everything that's going on in the world, too, right? Like during before COVID and maybe for the first two, one or two years, the interest rates were super low. The interest rates are very, very high now. So, if you apply for like a loan modification, probably you're going to get a super high payment, and you're not going to be able to afford it. So, what Peter is saying. A lot of the times we advise our clients now, unless there's no other way, not to apply for loan modification, but simply pay their arrears back in the regular Chapter 13 plan. Okay, that makes sense. Yep. All right. I feel like we covered a lot. Is there, is yeah. there, is there, other, is there a big part of this that we're missing at this point? So, so I, I do um, want to mention... Um, I also want to mention something. Oh, you want to? Yeah. Okay. No, no, well, you go we, first. we probably you can go mention first. a few things. Uh, I was going to uh, talk about like scams and stuff. Well, yes. scams. Yeah, well, we can, we can get into that in a second. Yeah. I, I just also want to say... Um, so bankruptcy is also good if you have additional property, right? So let's say you want to do a, what we call a cram down. And in in this cram down, in this, in this cram down, a yeah. cram down. So okay. this is like one of the magical things about. And applies to cars too. Okay. And applies to cars. So basically, let's say you have you Eugene, you, you're paying your first mortgage, but you have a second house, and you're like, oh, like, all right, I, you buy the second house in Buffalo, you buy it for three hundred thousand dollars. Now it's worth one fifty, right? And you say, no way, I'm you know I'm paying want to pay three hundred thousand on this house, but you know you're collecting good rent from it, right? So you can file a bankruptcy and do a cram down, which basically you provide an appraisal to the court and say, hey court, this home is only worth 150. And you'll and then the bank will probably provide one and you may have a hearing and then the court, let's say the court says, all right, it's worth 175. So then what you could do, you could either pay $175,000 to the bank instead of paying 300 to the bank, or you can distribute that 175 over the course of the bankruptcy plan and you could actually end up just paying 175,000 for the house when you originally contracted to pay 300. But you can also you can also cram down cars. Um, and then also one thing we've seen people doing, they've cr been cramming down taxi medallions <laughs> because they've been buying those for like 400. Yeah. And then they say, oh, I'm not making enough money off it. I can't pay you know a mortgage for four or a note for four hundred thousand dollars. So they'll go to court and say, hey, this medallion is only worth 125,000. You'll get a broker's price opinion. The court will say, okay, it's only worth 125. And you can pay that 125 over the course of five years. Yeah, and recently there's been so many tax medallion cases in bankruptcy, like a ton of them filing, I guess, because of like Uber and Lyft and everything, but a lot of them filing to cram down. Oh, wow. So it's okay. And, and that, just leaves, that just leaves the lender fucked because they gave you the, they paid off. You bought the house, they gave you a 300,000 loan. Someone got that $300,000, but you're only going to have to pay what the value of it is. Yeah, it's a tax write-off for them. Yeah. I mean, they're making billions so of dollars. It's also like for, rent, like it doesn't work for a primary property. You can't do it yeah. like... Oh, you can't do it in primary property. No, you no. cannot. Only like on the rental. But car, you can get them money. Sounds like I'm, I'm overpaying for my, my, my good friend Ant Towers. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right. Anything? What's? What, give me. Give us some other good stuff. Oh, you, you said you wanted to. Yeah. I mean, I think in the beginning when I talked about like we often get calls from people who are like, "Oh, we're two two days left. My house is going to be sold at the foreclosure auction. What do I do?" But a lot of the times, these people don't find us. A lot of the times, they find people who are actually like trying to scam them. Mm. And then, oftentimes, you know, those people who are not authorized to prepare bankruptcy. They'll take money from those people and prepare something for them. Or they'll take money from those people, you know, f those people don't even know that they file for bankruptcy. They don't know what they're doing. Those people are just directing them, telling them what to do. And they'll file for bankruptcy without even, like, realizing what they did. And oftentimes, because oftentimes it's, like, involved with real estate, they'll, like, yeah, convince those people to, like, either do a short sale or transfer the deed of the house to them. So there's a lot of bankruptcy scams that are going around New York City, at least. Uh, usually judges like to keep, like, an eye on that. And I've seen a bunch of times them directing, like, U.S. attorneys to investigate those bankruptcy petition preparers. Because technically, you, don't need, you can be a petition preparer and help someone prepare a bankruptcy petition and not be an attorney. But you have to disclose it on the application. Uh, almost never they disclose it. Um, oftentimes, I'll talk to people who filed for bankruptcy twice already, 
and they'll tell me, oh, I didn't know I filed for bankruptcy. I thought I was just doing something to stop the sale of my house or something like that. I'm like, no, you went to court and you, like, whoever you were working with, and and sometimes they'll, you know, those people are like, they don't have much money, they're just trying to save their house, and it's like their last savings and that they give to those people. And, uh, and are, are these scammers, do they appear in court, or both people? Well, they, they'll never go to court. Oh, yeah. yeah. So. They're like, they're scared of the judges will like murder them. Like. Damn. Damn. So I, I guess the person that they're doing the paperwork for, how did that person not know they're in bankruptcy court? Or they they never even show up to court. They file paperwork. Yeah, usually they'll never they'll file the paperwork with the court and they'll never return to court because oh. sometimes they're scared. Sometimes you know, obviously like especially like if English is not your first language. I see a lot of like Hispanic community where they do things like that. Like with this game. Or like, you know, you don't want to go to court. Like you don't know what you're doing basically. You just want to keep your house. And somebody told you the only way to keep your house is if you file for bankruptcy. Or they not, they might not even say that. They might, the only way to keep your house, you fill out this, I'll fill it out for you. You just have to go to that place out there and give the documents to somebody. And I guess where, I, I hear what you guys are saying. It seems like there's a, a deep connection between foreclosures, losing your house, and bankruptcy. Yeah. Where do these scams usually execute at? Like, like are these like these people are looking for help and they run on, run into the scammers instead of mm -hmm. the help? Like, wh why? Like, you know, like where is this happening? If that makes sense. So I think a lot of this is happening. I mean, basically in a lot of neighborhoods, right? Yeah. So New York actually passed a law in 2009 stating uh, only attorneys can charge money to help people. Uh, do home or do a home loan modification applications, but there are plenty of storefronts. People hold themselves out, uh, maybe not attorneys, but people who have worked in law firms for a long time, specialists, and you know they tell people, oh, I'm gonna you know do a modification application for you. I'm gonna file a bankruptcy for you. They they, they claim that they're gonna do all this stuff, and the the hardest thing is the the fact that I mean you have attorneys and communities, but you have a I feel like a lot more of these. Uh, you know, storefront, so, you know, down, down the corner, you know, or I'm sorry, down the street, you know, little old lady wanders in, you know, their nephew or niece say this person's good, but they have no idea what they're talking about. And then also people get some information that's very inconsistent with the law. Like people have come in before and said, oh, well, if I just file this bankruptcy, that's going to discharge my mortgage, right? Mm -hmm. That's all I need to do is file it and discharge my mortgage. And we say, Absolutely not. That's not the way it works. You just don't file and say, oh, mortgage is gone, car note is gone. Uh, you know, there's steps and, you know, definitely recommend anyone who's, you know, filing a bankruptcy, especially, especially chapter 13 and chapter 11, you need to speak with an attorney because they are way too complex yeah. to try on your own. Some people, you know, do some basic chapter seven stuff on their own. But again, that those are also easy ways to shoot yourselves in the foot because, again, as uh, Sam uh, Bankman Fried found out, once you file a bankruptcy, you can unfile it. Yep. But another thing they do is because foreclosure is public record, they can check when all the auctions are, when all the houses are going to be auctioned off, and they literally go door to door. They'll check, oh, those 10 addresses are going to be auctioned off on Thursday? Okay. We'll send someone just knock on their door and like, oh, your house is going to be auctioned off in a week. I can help you. And, wow. you know, they That's do things up. like and, that. And, and then another thing with the automatic stay. Sometimes these people, they will try to do things. They'll kind of screw the situation up. And they'll say, oh, we'll just file a bankruptcy to stop the sale of the home. But that only works up to a certain point. So you, the first time you file a bankruptcy within a year, you get an automatic stay on everything. Mm -hmm. The second time you file it, you get a stay for 30 days. Yes. But generally, it's you'll you'll get a stay and definitely in the home. But what the bank will start doing, and the banks have gotten uh, over the last five years or so, banks have gotten a lot savvier with mm -hmm. this. They'll go file a motion and say we want in rim relief, and yep. all in rim relief means that it's like we want relief over the thing, like r the rim. It's Latin, but basically <laughs> they say. Okay, they well, yeah, they, they they filed this they filed this bank uh, they filed this bankruptcy against the second time they filed it in a year, uh, the net like basically we want to be able to proceed with the foreclosure because this bankruptcy is, is not a good faith bankruptcy, and then the third time you file it within a year you get no automatic stay at all, but banks tend to be a lot savvier with this. So years. I guess I, what's what's a little confusing to me is 
any of those times, why are you refiling as compared to just proceeding with the bankruptcy? Well, they don't have an attorney who represents them. Most of the time, those people, they can't find actual help, someone who can help them. And they don't know what they're supposed to do in bankruptcy. They don't know like how to proceed, how to fill out everything properly, because it's a complicated process. And if they don't have an attorney helping you, instead they have the scammer who's going to be, yeah, I got everything taken care of. They don't know that it's not being taken care of. And most of the time, like whatever they file is completely deficient. And they don't know, for example, we talked about you have to go meet with a trustee, which is called a 341 hearing. They'll never show up because they don't know they're supposed to go to the hearing. And if you don't show up, the bankruptcy obviously can't happen. Also, um, we see that all the time. Yeah, no, that, that it, it's and most people when they file themselves, they don't file a full bankruptcy petition. So the law allows you to file what's called a skeleton petition. So let's say your home's getting sold tomorrow. You can file a skeleton petition. Basically, you put your basic information and all your creditors, which can be amended later. Mm -hmm. You file with the court. Thereafter, you have 14 days by rule to file all everything else, right? Mm. Uh, and the attorneys, I mean, at least I'm speaking for myself, I kind of hate when people file a skeleton and then they come and say, hey, can yeah. you file everything else? Because it really puts us, you know, under the gun. But, but a lot of people will file a skeleton or, you know, like potential fraudsters will file a skeleton, won't do anything else, let it get dismissed. And then when they can't do anything else, four months later, say, oh, we'll just file another one but they don't actually complete the process. Mm -hmm. And any bankruptcy trustee will tell you, you should not be filing these skeletons in bad faith just to stop a sale, right? If you, you do it if you need to, but you should be filing with the full intent to do a bankruptcy, to okay. complete the process, yeah. or at least get far enough in the process to resolve your issue. So basically, these, if I understand this correctly, these guys basically say, hey, you're, you're about to lose your house tomorrow. I can stop it for this fee. Mm -hmm. They successfully stop it. And then whatever the payment plan is, maybe it's like, all right, I'll give you 100 bucks to start it. And I'll give you the $400 to, 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 for, for me to really know that my foreclosure was paused. They get that. They, they get the 500 and then they're like, good luck. And they bounce. Oftentimes, they also just try to get the house, like, not just the fee. They also try to scam you out of the ownership of the house most of the time. And then they'll try to do like a short sale or whatever, however they want to do. And how does that in, work? Oh, short sale? So basically a short sale is when... The, <laughs> well, well, they, they say everything is a short sale. Well, yeah. but, but the short sale is when the amount you, ha you owe on the home is worth... Uh, I'm sorry, it's more than the value of the home. So let's say you owe 600000 on a home that's worth four hundred, And then what these people come in and try to say is, oh, well you know, bank, you can't sell this home for 600,000. Market's bad, the place is messed up inside, but I tell you what, you give it to me for two, you know, you give it to me for, uh, you know, I don't know, 300 or 250, at least you're getting some of the money back for your investors and I can go off and fix it up and make a nice profit for myself. And everyone wants to get a short sale because no one wants to pay market value for these homes. So everyone keeps saying short sale, short sale, short sale, but, I mean, at the end of the day, it's like, and, and a lot of banks attorneys have come up to me and they're like, they, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Why do people want to do all these short sales? Why don't they just like do a deed in lieu of foreclosure as in basically just give the home back to the bank and the bank For says, okay, way. we'll take it and we'll sell it, have a great day. And you know, instead of doing these short sales, um, and I kind of had to break it down to them. But um, also- and the reason is that they're being scammed. I mean, sometimes, I mean, not every not short sale is a scam, not every short sale, but a lot of the times when like you can do a proper short sale, if you owe way more in the house, than you know, it's worth, but a lot of the times these people try to sell like or scam you for way, way less. And a lot of the times they don't actually do a short sale. A lot of the times they induce you into signing some fraudulent documents where you sign off the deed to them and not even, mm. and then there are a whole lot of other yeah. problems with that. And then also another, a, a, a big thing we see too, right? It's like the people who actually have equity in their home, mm -hmm. homes worth 800,000, they owe 500,000. These people come and say, oh, let's do a short sale. Let's do a short sale. And they come to me and say, oh, I want to do a short sale. And I say, you have equity in your home. If you want to sell the home, just go sell it on the market. Mm -hmm. But see what a lot of these people, these short sales do, or at least they used to do. They'll say, all right, we'll sell it for this amount you know, over the table, but you know, under the table, you know, I'll give you $40,000.
because they're getting it for an artificially low price. That's and how it works. you know, a lot of these people, they never, they, I mean, the face of, like a lot of these people, working class people who are scammed, they never had that much um, uh, money in their bank accounts. And they just know they have a house that suddenly was, you know, just worth all this money that they paid like $50,000 for. Mm. And, you know, so people are confused. Sounds like you should hire an attorney. This is just scary out there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I would be remiss, especially to my brethren out there, high debt brethren, student debt brethren out there, to not ask you oh, about yeah. how does student debt in, in bankruptcy, how does it work out? Well, I'm under the impression that you can't do anything about it, but is there some, is there some gray area there? Well... It depends. Well, first of all, the first question would be like, what kind of student loan? Most of those are like federal student loans. Yeah, those you cannot get. Yeah. Generally, you cannot. <laughs> but if you got loans to like to go to Trump University and you got them from like some private whatever, you can probably discharge those as long as they're not federally backed student loans. And or like with Trump University, like I said, if the school is not qualified, you can also discharge them if it's not like a qualifying school. But generally, yes, it's a um, you know very difficult process. There's something that's called the Browner test. I don't know if you want to go over it, but um, basically, although recently they've implemented some additional guidelines, where it's a, I think a tiny bit easier to discharge student loans. But basically, like you gotta be like unemployed and no future prospects of having a good job and no future prospects of having a good income. Um, Is that the like brown? That. No, so there's, there's more stuff in the test. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, on a very basic level, it's it's three things, right? Okay. You pretty much have to be broke. You pretty much are guaranteed to be broke in the future, and then uh, at this, then at the same time, you've made a good faith effort to okay. pay back those yeah. loans. So I think so. There was a case in the first department, the case in the second department, where people actually got their federally black student loans discharged. And one was actually a situation with an attorney mm -hmm. who, opened a, who opened the law firm, uh, didn't go very well, and uh, uh, he or she, I think it's he, was able to get the uh, student loans discharged. But basically, I tell people, you basically have to be deaf, blind, Disabled, living in a desert, yeah. <laughs> and you know, like away from people, not be, it's, it's being able to find a job. It's, 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 a, it's a very high standard to me. I, I would imagine a lawyer would have lots of prospects, even if their law firm sucks. Like, what, what, how did he prove it? Was his reputation just ruined? Based on that bad <laughs> uh, law uh, firm? Other debts and stuff. It's been a while since I've read that case. Yeah. But yeah, it's like, like, other like for example, if you're disabled and you just show that you can't do. Although before, like Judge Morris used to be employed, like um, easier standard to discharge them, but then she started getting appealed too much and the judge on appeal started overturning all the student loan discharges. Okay. Yeah. Woo, guys. You oh. guys are making me sweat. I know it's hot in here. Know. Also, <laughs> taxes. <laughs> You can get oh, yeah, taxes discharged if if federal yeah, state one. if you owe if uh, if they're over three years old. So basically, from the time the time you do them, you can get them discharged in a seven or a thirteen. Um, only thing is, I hear the IRS is like, even though that's like it's a rule, it's like the IRS is kind of trying to push back on that yeah. somewhat. But you can you can get them discharged. But you also have to file them every year. So like, yeah. if you didn't file taxes, it doesn't matter. You have to file your tax every year. And then if they're more than three years old, you can discharge them. But if you did not file them, you can't just go and... I think you have to wait another three years yeah. from the date of filing. As in when, the, you know, when, yeah. All right, guys. Well, we went over a lot. To, please tell the audiences where, how they can get in contact with people like you guys who, if they have an issue, especially, hopefully, more than a couple of days out of their foreclosure dates that they can find uh, helpful information about this kind of stuff. Um, I mean, I can go. For, I mean, to be honest, I have more than enough clients. <laughs> but, um, first of all, thank you for inviting us, and I hope this was, you know, a very productive uh, conversation. I hope you, I, I hope your listeners have learned a lot, and there's something they can piggyback on. Um, as I said, I'm an attorney at Brooklyn Legal Services Corporation A. Um, our phone number is seven one eight four eight seven two three zero zero. You can also email us at info at bk.org. It's info at b as in boy, k as in king, as in apple.org. Nice. All right. And as I stated before, um, I'm an attorney at Access Justice Brooklyn. You can give us a call at 718-624-3894. 
Uh, and our email address is info, I-N-F-O, at accessjusticebk.org. So it's A-C-C-E-S-S-J-U-S-T-I-C-E, -S -S -E, like boy, K like kite, dot O-R-G, no spaces. Um, and then we do a lot of, we do a whole lot of uh, basic chapter seven work. Uh, so please get in touch with us uh, about that if, if, if you're wondering uh, if you qualify for... Uh, Bankruptcy, and then also we run the Claro Clinic, so that actually may be stop number one mm -hmm. because you may not actually need a need a bankruptcy. Um, yeah, that's about it. Well, thank you guys for being here. This is Attorneys with Swag. If you like what you see, like, subscribe, comment. Tell us about what you think about the episode. If you have any questions, we can run this back again. So put it in the comment section and check out our merch shop if you want to support Attorneys with Swag. We out. Should have seen it coming like a prophecy Cause the work got us moving with velocity We beasting now, it's some monstrosity We the plug to the source, unshockingly Wow, what's he really gonna do now? Jokes in your system better stay on the ground Votes in the circus is a spark to the sound The energy that entered me are jewels in my crown Wow, that's how it's always gonna be You'll never really get it like NRG Could do without the static and the flat to re Chill for I catch a charge like battery no style, what? turn your energy up. Energy no up. work, no what? Turn your energy up. Too wild, what? Turn your energy up. Turn your energy up. Energy up. Energy up. No style, what? Turn your energy up. Energy up. No work, work, what? Turn your energy up. Energy Too wild, what? Turn your energy up. Turn your energy up. Energy up. Energy up. No style, what? Turn your energy up. Energy up. No work, no what? Turn your energy up. Too wild, what? Turn your energy up. Energy up. Energy up, 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 energy uh, no weakness, just energy. Energy, energy, energy. Uh, just energy. Energy. Uh, no weakness, just energy. energy. Just energy. energy. Just energy. Uh, no weakness, just energy. Energy, energy. Uh, just energy. Energy. Uh,